In the world of investment and trading, Nasdaq has emerged head and shoulders above all the other exchanges around the world, especially for retail traders looking for high growth opportunities. The potential of disrupting technologies, redefining entire sectors of the economy, along with the possibility of exponential growth in the share price, has led many titles to begin their adventures here in order to become the next titans of tomorrow, such as Apple, Amazon, Tesla, and Alphabet. With all those precedences, it's normal for traders to also want to navigate the exciting and volatile waters of Nasdaq in order to identify a precise way to capitalize on what's going to redefine the enterprises of tomorrow. I mean, after all, this is one of the birthplaces of the modern economy based on the connectivity, speed, and analysis using the tools and technology of a new era. Amongst all those titles that may bring us wealth and opportunities lies Palantir, the data analytics firm based in Denver. Palantir has been an enigmatic company ever since it went public on the Nasdaq. With a reputation shrouded in controversies as a data aggregator and analysis platform, it has one of the deepest pockets and also relationships with the public sectors of large contracts in healthcare, defense, and intelligence gathering. Its price action is directly linked with the company's own fundamentals and risk appetite on the market, and with an increasing institutional participation in the company, there shows a lot of more like potentials to where the share price might go to. So before we actually begin today's video, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Palantir is one of the most popular stocks in the stock market, and many of us have decided to invest a significant chunk of time and resources in it. A recent dip of more than 20% in the stock market has left quite a few people baffled. And over the past few days, there have been many people trying to explain why has Palantir fallen in the stock market. And many of them may not be accurate on shedding the light on why this, like, this event occurred. So I'm going to try to get into some of the specifics that may allow people to understand what's going on behind the scenes. So with that being said, um, Palantir. This company that has given us so much hope, sweat and tears, is now giving us also a lot of surprises with its price action. What happened? What has caused this decline? Is this decline attributable to a particular individual, a self-centered figure or event that might be behind this entire situation? The reality is probably more complex than this. Of course, we may tend to oversimplify and sometimes mislead people in order to have more views or tractions, but despite the large amount of speculations, we have to remember that one of the primary causes is Palantir's own remarkable uh, price action. It has risen for about 185% on a year-to-date basis, even if we don't always see it that way. Some may argue that it's a natural pullback, it kind of neglects uh, the dynamics of the stock that consistently climbed over the past six months. The rest of the market in that time remained largely intact in a frozen state of anticipation. There's also a few voices in the street suggesting that insider selling might be the root cause of, a, of all evil. So is it insider trading with Alex Karp and Peter Thiel offloading their shares? This thought might be tempting to have, especially given that there were a number of occasions in the past where reports about Alex Karp selling his shares when a company was trading below $10 have been reported. And I believe that it definitely plays a significant role in the collective psyche of the traders right now. Regardless of how we want to like nullify those claims, not to mention that the latest insider sales comes from like Stephen Andrew Cohen, I would say that the plausible explanations really at the end of the day comes down to tax planning or personal expenses covering. Could it be linked to like a barren article circulating on Twitter? 
That article suggests that the Army's data platform might involve reducing annual amount and exploring open source vendors, or at least al alternative vendors. For this one, I would say that there is some merit to it, just like we talked about the other day, but it may still not justify such a decline that we have seen, because sure, Palantir has a lot of exposure in the public sector, but the company is also diversifying into other sectors and its relationships run fairly deep. In fact, if anything, this has been one of the reasons why Palantir is often considered as the more influential and more reliable compared to many of their counterparts, regardless of whether we agree with those reasonings. Of course, the fact that it wasn't included in the S&P 500 should not really be the culprit either, as this was anticipated back in July. The S&P pro process takes time, exemplified by Tesla's five-month waiting time. Valentia's turn is expected to occur in 2024, so not in the immediate future either way. Now, there might be another simpler reason to complement everything we just talked about as well. It just so happens that the $20 level is where a lot of options have been bought by the market makers in order to hedge their risks so that a lot of selling occurs at the vicinity of where the stock is. It doesn't explain everything, of course, but it definitely explains enough in terms of the existing forces playing against Palantir towards the end of 2023. Those who are optimistic about the stock's fundamentals are trying to take profit of their position in an ocean of losses. And those who believe that this stock is up for no good may also step on it as the opportunity is ripe. As Plantier tries to reach a critical, highly traded and shorted level while also facing uncertainty regarding major contract renewals, this is why it's only normal that Plantier stock faces major selling pressure. So with that being said, let's also take a look at the technicals. The trading volume of Palantir has recently been around 96 million shares versus an average volume of 70 million shares. Over the previous 52 weeks period, the price fluctuated between $5.84 and $21.85. The volume of shares traded tells us how many shares have been bought and sold at any given point in the in the market and if there is enough liquidity to support a trading strategy. If the float is thin, it would be very easy to influence the stock price, but low liquidity could um, mean that the demand is limited too. When we compare the current volume against the average volume, there might be the possibility for trend reversal or breakthrough if the difference is very large. For instance, if the stock were to break through, the current volume would be significantly higher than the average volume. The market cap of Palantir is currently around $42 billion, compared to the enterprise value of $15 billion. When we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 0.5% higher than the one-month low, 25% higher than the three-month low, and 193% higher than the 52 weeks low. On the options market, which often gives us a hint on the market sentiment about where the stock price is likely going to go next, the implied volatility is 54%, compared to a historical volatility of 80%. The put-call volume ratio is currently at around 40%, meaning about 40% of the market participants are anticipating for a very imminent decline in Palantir's share price. The most recent volume of all options traded is around 488,000 contracts a day versus the 30-day average of 355,000. Regarding the open interest, its most recent volume of open interest is around 3 million contracts versus the 30-day average of 3 million contracts. In terms of the shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own 39%, likely as a result of long-term holding and sometimes of short-term lending. Typically, it's always positive to see some institutional participation holding a stock long-term because it offers a layer of stability and a token of reliability in a medium to long-term. It means that the market is confident that 
it'll deliver value in the long term. An important factor to consider for people who want to become investors and not just simple traders. I think that usually the threshold should be around 25 to 30 percent of institutional ownership. The current short interest is around 8 percent of the total float, and 31 percent of those transactions come out from the dark pools. So, with around 8 percent of the total float being shorted, I don't think that there's much argument that there is a concerted shorting operation or that the market really views um, Palantir as something that's ripe for shorting. I don't believe that that would be the case. With that being said, is it possible that some people are genuinely feeling that maybe Palantir's price has gone up too too much too quickly? It's possible. But right now, this is not a selling point, in my humble opinion. So right now, the global markets are facing a complex interplay of factors that have the potential to significantly influence the equities worldwide. In this speculative analysis, I believe that the consequences of the global inflation, surging commodity prices, and decline quantitative easing, as well as the rise of inflation rates or interest rates, plus the geopolitical instabilities, are going to play a significant part. The increasing inflation rate has been putting pressures across the globe threatening the purchasing power, raising the input costs, and impacting corporate profitability. Companies operating internationally may face challenges in managing rising production costs and also to sustain profit margins. Those dynamics could trigger market volatility as investors adjust their risk-return expectations. The upward trajectory of commodity prices, including energy, metals, Agricultural products have been having far-reaching implications for various sectors of the global equities market. The companies heavily dependent on these commodities may experience squeezed profit margins, potentially affecting stock valuations and investor sentiment. The reduction or the end of QE's quantitative easing measures by the central banks worldwide may have resulted in reduced market liquidity. So this in turn could lead to higher borrowing costs for companies seeking capital, which may also discourage investment activities or will. The elevated market volatility plus the reduced investors' appetite may also continue to occur. Now, the central banks around the world are tackling this delicate situation of balancing the inflation rates with the economic stability and, if possible, growth. Central banks opted for aggressive interest rate hikes to combat inflations. Borrowing costs for companies have been rising, which has also slowed down business activities and also fueling the market's volatility in terms of the equity prices. Now, ongoing geopolitical tensions, including trade disputes, political uncertainties, and social unrests, will inject an additional element of volatility into the global markets. Investors may adopt a cautious approach, shifting towards safer assets, impacting the equities. Additionally, the escalating conflicts may disrupt supply chains, negatively impacting the performance of international companies. Given the interconnectedness of global markets, the aforementioned factors have reverberating effects on the US equities market. Companies with significant exposure to international market may face a lot of headwinds resulting from the economic slowdowns, disrupting the supply chains and the currency fluctuations. But nevertheless, the U.S. market is known for its resilience, and the diverse sectors may attract investors seeking safe havens. So really, the current landscape is characterized by global inflation, surging commodity prices, surging commodity prices, reduced quantitative easing, rising central bank inflation rates, geopolitical instabilities, and also ongoing lack of certainty regarding growth. 
While the US market may exhibit relative strength due to the safe haven status, it's going to remain interconnected with the global economic landscape. For long-term investors, these conditions may offer opportunities to identify undervalued companies with strong fundamentals and international diversification. With that being said, short-term trades should be approached with caution because of the increased volatility and uncertainty. And also, we should be careful when assessing individual companies, sectors, or regions. So now the question would be what I would re really recommend for Palantir. So my recommendation for Palantir is to keep in mind that a current price action probably isn't the best. Nobody wants to catch a falling knife. But the macroeconomic circumstances may still give the market another major boost in demand for riskier assets, especially if the interest begins to fall in the year to come. So despite the potentials for lower rebounds, which is always possible, like it wouldn't really surprise me if Palantir goes down to like $15, I still believe that Palantir is a stock that's worth accumulating over time. The only question is how patient one should be with it. So I think that Palantir should be slowly bought over the next two years to ensure that the cost basis is as low as possible throughout the looming recession. But ultimately, it's actually worth our while to invest in such a company as long as AI and big data remain relevant themes for investors. So I would recommend to commit between 3-5% to of your portfolio's capital into the stock. 